Welcome back to Rainmakers TV. This is part three of the interview with John Bellamini of the Center for the Greater Good. And we are spending so much time because there is so much substance. We encourage you to go to the website, www.centerforgreatergood.com. It's going to be up on the screen often. John, welcome back. Thank you. Um, before we get into uh, kind of re recapping a few things, I wanted to talk a little bit about financial services. Uh -huh. Essentially, what you, you do at the Center for, for the Greater Good is you're part of the financial services industry. Correct. They've not been what most people would call philanthropic. Absolutely. Is there a change that's going on? There is a change going on, and I'm happy to report that. You know, I was at the Milken Institute um, in May, and I was on a panel, and the panel is called Investing in the 99%. You know, and the Milken Institute has done some really great work, and they gather 18% of the world's wealth there, and there was actually 15 to 20 panels on impact investing. Now, is impact investing the way you've been talking about it in the other two shows, which is truly investing in community, reducing the cost of capital, is everybody think about it that way? No, and there's a real danger that impact investing could end up being just a marketing ploy. Um, there's a lot of great groups out there um, trying to do lower cost capital, and then there's other groups out there that are saying, hey, here's an opportunity to put a label on it and raise more capital. And I, I hope that's not the future of the industry. So the, the key is transparency then, right? Yes. And transparent is what uh, the Center for the Greater Good seems to be because you put your plan out there yep. for everybody to see on the website and we're going over a good bit of it. Um, the, uh, the thing that we're talking about right now is health and wellness uh, and, and its role in alleviating or eliminating poverty. And one of the things you talk about is wellness and fitness and nutrition and food security. How would a group like yours have any impact on that? Sure. So um, we have the community coordinator model, right? Mm -hmm. And we work with the residents, and we identify what are the gaps. And if food security is one of the gaps, then we start working on how can we close that gap. And on obesity, if that's one of the needs of the population that we're serving, then our community center would be organized to have a training center in there and bringing in coaching skills. And again, it just goes back to what does the community need and want, and we help fund that. But if you're in poverty right now, if you yeah. if you go to the grocery store and you're, and you're looking to get a meal for your family, Great. You, you go to the grocery store and you get the things that you really feel like are good for, for your family, and they're more expensive than if I go down to the fast food place and I get my $2.99 special. Absolutely, and so one of the things we're doing um, is by providing low-cost capital to communities, we can help fund um, grocery stores that are healthy, that are not, uh, no offense towards the people at Whole Foods, that are not um, whole paycheck. You know, They're healthy, quality foods within a convenient distance, so the mom doesn't have to take a bus six miles, 10 miles, and spend three hours trying to get healthy food for their family. So commercial development is actually part of what you do as well? We finance the commercial development. Wow, very interesting, because you do have right, uh, a very interesting uh, statement, and I've never heard this before, and this comes from the Food Research and Action Center, that BMI and income have an inverse relationship. Is that true? It is, according to many experts that we've spoken to and reviewed. You've got a whole section in your outcomes evaluations criteria on social obligation. Before we get into what you're talking about, I wanted to ask this, who has a social obligation? All of us. Why, why, would, why would you say that? Why would we not just adopt what Milton Friedman said in that if I'm a business, my, uh, my sole reason is to serve my shareholders? It doesn't work. It's been proven not to work. Look at, look at our re recent economic collapse. Look at the poverty rates around the world. Look at the wars we have. It's not working. It's fundamentally not working. And it's time for all of us to say we are one. We're all connected. My actions affect you. And how do we work together towards the common good? Right now, as we speak, the United States is in a presidential campaign. There are other countries in the world, Ghana being another one, that is in a presidential campaign, and they're not very friendly. Uh, social obligation doesn't seem to be anywhere on the table on anybody's presidential campaign. Um, so a lot of our governments around the world, they thrive upon us being divided. And um, my basic theory is that the more divided we are, the more we need government. The more we unite, the less we'll need government. And so they have a vested interest in us not being united. Hmm. 
Well, that's a that's an interesting statement. Is there a role of government then in the type of impact investing that you do? There is, and there are some great people um, making some great strides. You know, Secretary uh, Clinton organized the impact global impact economy, which is great. Uh, Jonathan Greenblatt, working for President Obama, is out there uh, creating the market, and so there's whole pieces of government that are doing really good things. And I do think they're a part of the solution. I also think they're a part of the problem, not the groups I'm working with, but other parts of the government. Hmm. Let's go to a statement that is, you know, frankly, it's not politically correct. Uh, <laughs> some people may see it's even uh, not very sensitive. Uh, but this guy actually comes from the Chil Children's Environmental Learning Center and says this, lower income youths can be susceptible to illegal forms of income leading to grave effects on families. What have you found in terms of the Center for the Greater Good in terms of, of what you can do about that? Again, it goes back to having a stable household, not having overcrowding, not having childhood mobility issues, not having nutrition deficits. It's all the fundamentals that go into a person that make these decisions uh, happen. This is a huge undertaking that, that you have because this isn't a home loan. Back in show one, we were talking about a home loan, and you corrected me. Uh, this is seriously social change. Yes, it's social and financial change. And does can one work without the other? Can there be social change without financial change? No. So then, is that the reason that you have a, a financial services company, a traditional financial services company, as as a partner of yours? That's correct. What do they do? Uh, They've been in business 40 years. Um, they own 20 billion in assets in the U.S. and they underwrite the investments and they asset manage the, the investments on the physical side. We work on the social side with our partners and we've combined the two together. You could call us an investment bank with a soul. Hmm. An investment bank with a soul, that's, that's interesting. Let's continue on with the, the social obligation and social responsibility and you've got a sub-concern, well there's three. Uh, crime, community pride, and domestic violence and child abuse and neglect. Certainly very serious social problems in every city around the world mm -hmm. um, and probably in rural areas too. What do you do to impact this in a positive way? So this is where our next innovation is coming. Um, the 45 million people in the U.S. and you know, the billion people worldwide, a great thing is happening for them. And this is where technology can play a great role. Um, creating biofeedback directly to the communities to say, hey, this is what's going on in your community, this is where it's happening, this is when it's happening, and this is what you can do to change it. And providing that access to everybody. And going to the community and saying, what do you want on a national basis and on a worldwide basis, and having that drive the change. I think I know what biofeedback is, but when you talk about it, how, how are you... Um how are you talking about it in terms of what the Center for the Greater Good does in relation to... Sure. So if I, if I looked at a map and I said, this building is responsibly financed, not just green, but responsibly financed, and this building, uh, this community, its, it's residents feel safe. Its residents um, feel healthy. Its residents are happy. And these may sound like soft and mushy things, but mm -hmm. you know, there's a study around epigenetics that's put out by UC, uh, UC Irvine, and they're one of the people that helped us uh, generate this report and reviewed it and gave us information. Um, what they found in studying cancer patients is that the soft questions were a better predictor of the cancer patient survival rate than the actual blood work. Really? Yeah. How so? Um, they would ask the cancer patients, you know, how do you feel? Do you feel healthy? And those that responded positively to that, despite what their blood work said, had a higher survival rate. Hmm. So it, it is go back to Dale Carnegie's power of positive thinking. Is that what we're talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. And I've uh, benefited from Dale Carnegie in my young 20s. Let's go to something else. You're talking about the core and enhanced services. And um, you've, the very first thing you talk about is seniors, hugely important. Why is it that seniors are so important in your mind? Oh, so, so many reasons. So as a young child, uh, my grandparents were very influential for me. I'm very grateful for them. And I've always taken the attitude that those that have been around longer than me know a heck of a lot more. I learn every day from them. And so that's just a fundamental thing. Uh, two, 
Uh, there's seven, you know, in the U.S., there's 78 million uh, worldwide. We have a huge aging population, mm -hmm. and most of them are broke. Well, in, in fact, yeah. the World Health Organization statistics are that uh, the number of people over 60 will triple between the, uh, the years 2000 and 2050, and that the uh, less developed world is going to go up by four times, by four times. So people in the less developed countries are, are living longer, yeah. uh, yet the poverty rate is likely to go up, isn't it? It's likely to go up. The health care costs are likely to go up. And there's, this, there's some very fundamental things. So seniors, what I've been told by the seniors is, and I've witnessed is that when they're active and they're given a purpose, they live a lot longer, they live a lot healthier, and there's a way to involve them in the solution instead of saying, you go over here and, and hang out. It's, we want them in our community centers. We want them with, our, with the youth. We want them involved in the solution and helping deliver in the solution. This is again something different than uh, what uh, others I have I have talked to in the past about community development uh, in terms of financial services. You're talking about actually engaging with the person as you develop the plan. I guess absolutely. There and, is no plan unless the citizens are involved. And do you, do you already have your community coordinator picked by the time you go in? Um, not necessarily. We may hear about a project and then we. Have, through our partners, we'll evaluate who are the right players, mm -hmm. who are the right people to involve, and are, then they're interviewed. Uh, do, you, do you build specifically senior housing as well? We finance the senior housing. Yep. Finance the senior housing. All right. Now, uh, and the reason that I'm saying that with a smile is because you have, you have uh, corrected me several times, <laughs> and someday I'll get this. <laughs> Uh, one of your core concerns, or, or your your uh, prime concerns, is education with regard to core services and seniors. Um, is this kind of a fun thing? You know, hey, I'm a senior, so how about if I go learn how to play the piano? No, it, it extends their life. It gives them a sense of purpose, and it also gives them the way to, again, connect with the community. It's not just, I mean, sure, fun is good, but there's some serious, uh, if you look at, there's many studies out there that point to involving seniors in the arts. Uh, Tim Carpenter has a radio show in Los Angeles that he talks about. He's done a great job, and I've walked in his buildings and seen the, the senior buildings, and there's these huge art all over the building. And the seniors put it out, and they have art day, and they interact. It, it gets them to interact instead of isolate. Again, poverty, isolation, lack of information, the two main causes of it. So all of these things that you've talked about, whether it's uh, with regard to economic stability or, or regardless of what it's about, um, so what some people might say, squishy. Yes. Um, does it have an impact on payback? It does. It has an impact on the uh, condition of the, the physical asset. Um, if people have community pride, and, and think about this. Think about if you had an opportunity to invest $50 in your community, would you care about it more? Sure. Absolutely. That product exists today. It's not marketed correctly. There are great organizations out there that have community investment notes, but they're not widely adopted. There's a chance for our country to issue people bonds. Take the state housing authorities and issue a people bond, just like we had the war bonds. You could do this worldwide. You could have people bonds and say, guess what? Put in your capital, get a 1% return, not all of your capital, but 50 bucks, $100, and put it away for 20 years and get it back and watch your community flourish. And every day you wake up, you're going to be looking to make sure your community is in shape. Your privately held company are... Um is it okay if I ask you what the size of your company is in terms of assets? Um, sure. So our revenue has gone from uh, basically zero in 2009, and last year we hit about 800,000, and we spent 800,000. And uh, I've been taking a salary of 3,000 a month, and that's how uh, how we do it. So I mean, what you're saying is that you have uh, well, you you participated in uh, the project in Hawaii that was 135 million dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, project. You've got other projects that you're in. What's the total, I guess, amount of all of these projects that you're involved? So the projects that we're that we are directly involved in that we helped finance is about 240 million. Um, again, we helped. We're part yeah. of the team. Mm -hmm. And then um, our, if you add our partners up that are committed to this, it represents about 40 billion in assets. Yeah. So we're not talking about a small investment, is what is my point. Uh, and. All of your partners are committed to these social programs, essentially, that you have as a necessary part of making Correct. an investment. Uh, something else about seniors, and you, you touched on it, is seniors in health. 
-hmm. what, um, what do you do as part of the, the financial services, uh, the, the making of a loan is going to impact the senior's health? Um, so again, if we design a building, there's two ways to design a building. You can cram it full of units, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can say, you know what, we're going to take the bottom floor, we're going to leave it open for community space, for nonprofits to be in there, and whatever the community decides needs to be in there, which causes interaction, which causes them to come out, and we're going to lower the cost. We could have a healthcare center put in the bottom. We could have a teledoc put in there. So all kinds of things we can finance, not even finance, but include as a part of the building structure. Mm. Very good. Uh, let's go to the core and enhanced programs of programs for families. Can you define family for me? Uh, it's whatever it is to you. You know, family can be um, you and your parent. It could be you and a sister. It could be you and an adopted child. It could be you and a foster child. It's, so it's, there's not a prescription as to what a family is? No, not in my opinion. So in terms of then the social obligation for family and, and uh, education and then all of these different core services, how do you get your information that this is needed or that is needed so that you make the appropriate investment for the community? Uh, we find the right people in the community that are respected, and then we work with the residents, and we, we ask them, we meet with them, not me personally, um, sometimes I do, but we have people that the community trusts, and they're, they're interviewed, and they're asked questions, and they're saying, How, what do you need? It's really back to that basic assessment. Don't do anything until you really understand what the community wants. There's a statement from the Urban Institute 2010. 49% of American babies born into poor families will be poor for at least half of their childhoods. Essentially, this is the cycle of poverty. Some people uh, will, will say that there are, are people inside areas of influence that want to keep people in poverty. In poverty. Is that accurate? I don't, I don't have a judgment on that, but it seems that our system is set up to be that way. And you're trying to change that? I am. What's been the reception so far? You know, three years ago, I was called a heretic, and, uh, and um, I've been on a, a tour since April 30th, and uh, I've collected over 400 mm -hmm. business cards, and I've had people coming up to me after my um, speaking engagements, and they said, we want to work with you. How can we help? And it shifted, um, and that's because of the great partnerships and the investment that we've made to make sure this works. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for a frame of reference, it's uh, May the 24th. So you've been on your, your tour now for almost a month. Yes. Uh, you talk about um, abolishing poverty throughout a lifetime. What, is, what does the Continuum Fund do? So the Continuum Fund uh, borrows capital and invests it in communities to um, help people overcome poverty. And we invest in affordable housing, charter schools, low-cost student housing and then the other infrastructure that's required by the community, whether it be healthcare centers or small businesses or entrepreneur zones. You know, this is really interesting, the, the process of, of the community and, and what's needed, because we've talked in these now three shows, we've talked about seniors, we've talked about families, we, we've talked about all sorts of age groups and all sorts of very difficult problems. And it still comes down to the community saying, we need this. Yep. Have you found that communities, in all of the projects that you've done, that the communities are, are willing and open and able to help you make those decisions? Uh, in the beginning, they're not. You know, our partners uh, reported to us it takes a while to build that trust. And so it's not just coming in you know, on the white horse and saying, we're here to save you. It's really coming in, being humble, asking what's needed, and working with the, working with the citizens and the local authorities and the nonprofits and everybody, and really helping them organize and think through things. Hmm. I teach a, a business course in college, Business Government and Society, and I talk about the, a great business philosopher, and I say the, his, his words were, tell me I'll forget, show me I might remember, but involve me and I'll understand, and that was Confucius. Yes. Um, so it sounds like that's where you're coming from. It is. Hmm. Very interesting then. And the Center for the, for the Greater Good with Citizens First Housing, let's talk about that, where you're starting on the ground and, you, and you've got the thorough needs assessment and the information education and resident feedback. Do you expect the residents, it, let me put it this way, if you've got someone who, is, who has an illegal operation in that, in that area of residence, do you think that they're going to be warm and, and fuzzy with you and say, you know, come on in? Uh, most likely not. And. Um you know, illegal operations that harm our tenants and our residents will not be tolerated. 
If you get everything that you want out of your work in the Center for Greater Good, what is that going to be? Um, that the way that financing is done around the world is changed and it is socially responsible and profitable. Is profit, you know, because profit in some places seems to be a dirty word, but is profit okay? Profit is needed. Sustainability is needed. You know, the model of uh, handout and grants has failed us, and so we need to create a sustainable way to create good for society. And the second part of what would be great is if poverty was cut in half. I, I'm under no delusion that poverty is going to disappear forever, but it doesn't have to be at the level it's at. You know, you've talked about a very important person throughout, and actually very important people, and, you, and they are the, the community coordinators. How'd you come up with that idea, and where do you, where do you look to find them? Uh, again, uh, the Better Tomorrow's nonprofit that mm -hmm. we helped uh, the Michaels Development Group uh, launch. They're a shining example of the community coordinator. They were paying for it out of their own pocket for the last 20 years, and um, they have 120 of these people. And we've gone to Camden, New Jersey. We've gone to lots of their projects and met the community coordinators and worked with them to design this Good Life Guidebook and our thinking, and it's, it has been proven to work. Um, what, what kinds of people are community coordinators? They're awesome people. They're the kind of people that can drive me around in a suit in Camden, New Jersey. And people open the door and go, hey, Miss Hattie, how's it going? You know, and wave and smile. And they're, they're, um, they're trusted advisors. They're social workers. They're friends. They're, they're everything to the community. They're great people. Why is it that you think that this model can work in a country outside the United States? The model works actually outside of the United States already. Community coordinators are actually something that you see all over the world. Um, you know, the U.S. is learning, I think. In some, from some of these countries. In England, it's working. In, in, uh, in Africa, if you look at how some of these groups are organized, it is about the community coordinator. That is their strength. And we're looking to, we're looking to provide these community coordinators with access to capital, access to um, a budget, so they can actually be even more productive. Why would people in, and I want to be careful about this, but why would people invest in impact investing which has a socially responsible aspect to it, instead of going out and doing their own thing and trying to everything they could to make a 12% return. Well, if they're if they're orientated to do good in society, and they've been giving their money away, as we've shown, they've given away 4.5 trillion, and, and nothing's changed. A lot of good's been done, but you know we still have most of the same issues around. Um, their cost model is wrong. If they're earning 12%, giving away 6%, why not just earn a little bit less and do good with it and eliminate the cost? Mm -hmm. Now, many years ago when you were eight years old and you just started that paper <laughs> route, did you have any idea that this is where you would end up? Um, no, I, I had no idea where I was going to end up. I just knew I wanted to have a different life and, um, and do something good. And so you feel like that you are? I feel I finally am uh, using my skills for good, and I'm grateful for that. When you were in the financial services business and doing very well and, and making lots of money, wasn't that doing good too? Uh, not for me personally. Not for, my, not for my wife at the time, no. Why not? You were making a lot of money. It, we weren't, I wasn't happy. So, uh, I mean, is money the root of all evil? No, it's our choices and how we and how we use it. I see. So the financial services business in general can it change? It can, and I think it is, and I think it can change by listening to its consumers and engaging them. Let's go back to the social services. This is uh, the CGG, the Center for Greater Good, innovation in social services, starting on the ground. You've got educate, assess, collaborate, coordinate, evaluate, and report. At the end of the day, what kind of report do you get from the community coordinators? Um, it depends on what the assessment said. So back to, these, back to what the citizen said and what the community coordinator said. So the report can be, um, you know, did the crime rate drop? What are people's happiness? What's the health? Um, it, it could be any of these um, hundreds of indicators that we've gone through. 
We just have about a minute left. And, you know, we, we've kept John Bellamini here of the Center for Greater Good. We've kept him here for three different shows, 90 minutes worth of shows, because there's so much substance in this. Strongly encourage you to go to the website, www.centerforgreatergood.com. But, in, in again, in the minute or so that we have left, it's 10 years down the road. Let's say that we're, we're coming back here in the year, uh, what, 2022. And I'm saying, you know, John, how'd you do for these past 10 years? What are you going to tell me? Um, I'm going to turn you over to the people that we've helped, and you can ask them. Great answer. Yeah. We'll see you right here next time. And, and again, John Bellamini, Center for Greater Good, and we'll see you right here next time on Rainmakers TV. Take care.